the uh, bread. Hello. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I'll be giving a talk today on the uh, the essentials of breast imaging, uh, tips and pearls. Um, I did my undergrad in uh, medical school and residency at uh, Michigan State University, and then I did a fellowship in breast imaging uh, at Brigham and Women's. Um, I'm in a dedicated uh, breast uh, imaging practice. Uh, read about 11,000 mammograms a year, about 10,000 screeners. Um, so I've been in practice for about uh, 10 and a half years now. Uh, it's a very rewarding field. So I have no disclosures. The objectives today are to uh, look at a systematic approach to interpreting a mammogram. It includes an image quality assessment. Uh, I'll share my protocol. Um, we'll understand the danger zones of where tumors like to hide out, um, pattern rec recognition, and the value of uh, defining extent of disease for our treating uh, physicians. Part two uh, will be a case review well, uh, from perception to application of the BIRADS assessment and management. And today we're, we'll focus really on the conventional workup using mammography and ultrasound. So there's eight criteria I'll just briefly touch on uh, for uh, a quality assessment for mammography. Uh, this is a reference here to uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Thames. So eight criteria. Um, with uh, positioning and compression being, as well as exposure being uh, leading reasons for clinical image failure. And so uh, we're all aware of the standard MLO and CC views. Um, the reason why we do an oblique view is because we want our upper outer quadrant tissue uh, well vis visualized. This is where most of our cancers and fibroblender tissue uh, is distributed. So that's the reasoning behind uh, just hanging a view in the MLO. And then our th th the cost is, is that we miss uh, posterior medial tissue um, with this with this oblique uh, projection. So uh, we have to be careful when we go to CC view. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we always want to include that posterior medial tissue. Um, now going back, uh, the MLO projection and our whole goal today is is to detect early cancers from the fibroglandular tissue. And so how we're going to do that is we need to separate the tissue. That means we need to compress the breast. And so uh, and compressing the breast, we're going to pull out the mobile t uh, tissue from the fixed pectoralis. And pulling that out, we also open up the inframammary fold, and that's important. And with good anterior compression, we'll have a nipple in profile and allows us to see the tissues uh, deep to the nipple. So that's good positioning for uh, an MLO. Those are the criteria. We want that tip of the uh, pectoralis muscle to meet the nipple line uh, at, this, at this depth. So. Moving on to the CC view, we also want to have good compression and separate these tissues out so that we can see a tumor that might be hiding in fibroblender tissue. And so we're going to pull out, and hopefully, optimally, we'll see uh, the pectoralis muscle. Um, we want the nipple to be straight. So for exaggerating, like if we're exaggerating the exaggerated CC view and the nipple is pointing immediately, we may be mi missing that posterior medial tissue that we know is important to include in the CC view. Now, when you submit images for the ACR, um, they're going to look at the posterior nipple line, make sure that uh, we have enough tissue. So if you don't include the CC view pectoralis muscle, then we need to have an assurance that we have included enough uh, tissue deep. So posterior nipple line is important. It runs from the uh, nipple back to the pectoralis, perpendicular to the anterior pectoralis. And it needs to be within a centimeter of the CC line a centimeter uh, from the MLO line. So if we have 10 centimeters, we want at least nine, not eight and a half. Those will be re uh, reasons for failure. So here, if we take our posterior nipple line back, um, we don't have enough uh, pectoralis. And here, motion blur, very important. A uh, little bit of motion, we lose visualization of these calcifications. This is a, an exam from a couple weeks ago, and we have to do the right thing and call this patient back. So it's very important the work that our technologists do every day. Um, there's a lot of art and effort into getting really good imaging for us and relaxing the patient. We want the patient to not have a you know unpleasant experience. We want her to comply in the future with getting her screening. So all the work our technologists do um, to give us a, the best imaging possible is is important. And it's also important for us to be uh, relaxed uh, when we sit down to read a mammogram and have a protocol in place and practice so that we can find these tumors as, uh, as early as possible. So this is my, my protocol. I'm, I'm pretty simple. Um, everybody uh, you know, has different ways of uh, viewing. I like to keep it simple. I keep my currents uh, on the bottom, sort of the, 
look at the forest, uh, the lay of the land, look at the overall glandular distribution, uh, and then I will hone in on the uh, the full field one-on-one -on -one current, and I always compare against the three to four years back. And then I have a pan zoom feature. Um, I often use a, a handheld magnifier on top of that. It can uh, quickly assess for microcalcifications against uh, you know three years uh, stability. Uh, and and then I work through the MLO, right MLO, onto the same format, um, and, and then to the left, pan zooming at all times. Um, but I. You want to have at least a three to four years back. You're comparing. If there's any any question at all, then I can immediately scroll through this packs. You know, you can go further back in, in time, or uh, or or sooner. At any point, there's a question, and that's that's pretty much it for the standard 2D. I have a search uh, pattern, search zones where I like to look um, consistently. Uh, and behind the nipple is always a tricky area, so I start out looking subareolar, and then immediately laterally. Same approach for the MLO view, um, right behind the nipple, and then inferiorly and laterally, or excuse me, superiorly. And tomal synthesis it should not be afraid of. It's just we have more information. It's just more mammograms, more images through this, the, uh, the, the two MLO and CC views. Um, there's a lot more information. Uh, but you know, I, I typically read the 2D exam first <clears throat> and then the 3D exam. And I use the same search pattern for those, uh, those zones, the subaerial or the medial, for the 3D. But your eyes can't be uh, in more than one place at one time. So you can't sort of just stall like you might with a 2D. Uh, you have to really stay focused. If you're looking behind the nipple, you really can't be looking in the axillary tail at the same time. So it, obviously it does take more time, but there's a lot more information. So a couple things we have to understand um, is that the CC view is not orthogonal to the MLO view. So it's going to require some thought to correctly localizing a lesion. And so I sort of think of it as uh, if you, you know, the reason, again, why we're doing the MLO view is to, is to capture more upper outer quadrant tissue, which we don't have as much with uh, ML projection. So I sort of think of it as a, a plain uh, tilted. And if this is the lateral part of the, the breast and the CC view at the tip, and the medial part of the breast is the oblique uh, plane uh, writes itself at a 90 degree outer view, then your lateral most tissue is going to drop and it's going to drop the most because it's the furthest from the central axis. And the same, likewise, with the medial tissue, as, as we write itself to a 90 degree lateral, it's going to rise. So that's really important in localizing our lesions. And the, the tip of the plane is going to rise the most. The central axis will, will have very little change between MLO and ML. And there's utility in rolled views um, in, in localizing a lesion. Um, use them a lot for small little asymmetry. This is a postmenopausal A. Uh, she developed this uh, new asymmetry here. It's sort of hard to see on the MLO view, maybe in this area, hard to see. So we'll add some rolled, or excuse me, some spot compression imaging first, our diagnostic workup. And it's not as dense as the, uh, the, un the standard CC view. And that can be tricky. Certain tumors like lobular carcinomas will, you know, they can disperse right into normal fiber glands or tissue. So you have to be careful. But it, sort of wants to hang around here on the ML view. I think that's probably the area. Uh, one thing I've, you know, I've learned is if uh, your spot compressor looks like it goes away, but there's any suggestion that it's, it's still uh, hanging around in the ML view, I go to ultrasound. Just make sure there's nothing real. So we also added the roll views in the situation just to make sure, for one reason, it, does it persist? And it does. So this is real. I got to go to ultrasound. We got to chase this. It was a new finding. This is real. So it, role views can just help give it added, uh, you know, more information uh, uh, with the spot compression imaging is, is uh, not exactly, uh, you're not uncertain if it's a true persistent lesion. When we do the role views, lesions above the nipple will roll medially and lesions below the nipple will roll laterally. And so this is the expected location. This is about where it was on slightly lateral to the nipple. And so it rolled slightly medially when we did a medially rolled uh, view. So that's, just, that's at least above the nipple. Same thing with the lateral uh, rolled. If we roll the breast laterally, uh, this, this little asymmetry, and this usually not as helpful because, again, most of our glandular tissue is upper quadrant, so it can roll right into the, so and not be as well visualized. So medial rolls are often are, are, are more helpful usually. Um, and so, we have a way of localizing a lesion. We're going to utilize uh, our resources with role views, and we're going to understand the difference between MLO and ML views. But we also need to know, as we uh, 
move forward, what are the danger zones? Um, so we're extra cautious in uh, looking at the subaerial or breast, or what I consider four danger zones, the, the medial breast, retroglandular fat plane, that area in the uh, corner of the image. So here's our uh, standard views. This lady's had a prior biopsy right behind the nipple. She's got an obscured mass, which corresponds to a solid irregular hypocoke mass, indistinct and angular margins. Here is the tomal composite view, <coughs> and we can see there's architectural distortion right behind the nipple. That's a tough area. It's easily missed tumors. And here's her sonographic correlate. It's a solid irregular speculated mass. This is a recent case, 43-year-old. She was called back for uh, off of her baseline exam, no uh, significant family history, uh, and she had a dominant mass, the reason why she was recalled. If we look more carefully, there's a focal asymmetry in slightly medial, and it's in the retroglandular fat. It's of concern. The mass was proven to be a cyst, as expected, but the small asymmetry is a solid irregular hypocoic mass. That was a grade 2 invasive ductal carcinoma. And this lady's had a prior lumpectomy. You can see the surgical clips. If you look very carefully in the posterior medial breast, there's a speculated uh, mass, high density mass. Actually, I wouldn't use the word speculate until I've done a diagnostic workup, but there's a, there's a mass there that was new. And so if we're in our mind from the screener that this was a 3 o'clock lesion, we have to always keep in mind, if you pay attention, MLO to ML, it, it rises. It actually rose quite, you know, it's 3 or 4 centimeters. This is a one o'clock lesion. So if you're trying to find you know, a four or five millimeter mass and you're focusing in the wrong zone, you're trying to perceive it, it's already a challenging mass to perceive. You want to be extra, you know, extra cautious and, and careful in localizing correctly that this is an upper inner quadrant lesion. So you target your, your, your targeted ultrasounds is successful. And here we have a solid irregular hypocoic mass with some uh, indistinct margins. And it's an invasive ductal carcinoma. Scattered fibrogenzer pattern. We have a mass that's obscured in that uh, upper outer quadrant tissue. And the clue, when you're looking along the retroglandular flat plane, is you want to see, here's the ultrasound correlate, if you, you perceive convexity. When you see convexity in the zone, be careful, there's a mass, a three-dimensional mass with convex margin that's hiding out. So this is a small focal developing asymmetry. Um, subtly changing. It's in the retroglandular fat zone. That's a danger zone. And here's the ultrasound coral that we see a hypocoic irregular mass. It has an echogenic rim, some posterior acoustic shadowing. That's an invasive ductal carcinoma. And here we have our MLO and ML views. We see a little rounded asymmetry. That's a you know reasonable location for a lymph node. We see day in and day out. But it's a the base of cancer, irregular mass. It dropped. Couldn't see it on the exaggerated uh, CC views or the exaggerated lateral. So uh, going from MLO to ML, we see it drop. So it's a lateral lesion. So we can target our ultrasound carefully. The clue with this is if you're only looking one year back, you may not perceive a significant change. So it, I go through the file. I'm absolutely sure that that's uh, that's been stable. It's a lymph node. Go through. The beauty of you know, our digital world, we can easily compare on the day of film. You can, you can only load you know one extra film on the, and, and for comparison, it was it was effort to give through the jacket. But now we have you know digital, we can easily compare, and we should because this patient's been coming in every year. She's or thereabouts she's quite compliant. Let's use the data that she's given us. So uh, go back four or five years, there is nothing there. I kept comparing. Sometimes you see little lymph nodes that pop, but just differences in position. There was nothing there. This is concerning. This is this is a biorad. Four, we're going to chase this, and sure enough, that was an invasive cancer. So the comparison uh, is key. Um, you will increase your detection. This is very subtle early in indolent cancers, and you definitely can reduce your callback rate if you just take the time to compare. And there's a paper that supports this, uh, Dr. Sickles, last October, um, looking at uh, comparison, two or more priors, uh, significantly reduced the recall rate and increases your cancer detection rate. It takes a little time, but if you can, you know, eliminate unnecessary diagnostics each day, that, that's helpful. Here's another example. If you're just looking, you know, year to year, this is even going back to 2011. I called her back because the density is just a little more dense, a little, a little more bothersome. But I want to take the time to go through again all of her imaging. 
if we look at this, here's our fiber glandular. This is not, this is to be clean. Or this is this is clean, this is not clean. So we have a definite interval change. It's, it's uh, getting a little bit more dense than it should. We've got to work this up. Another example, same this little asymmetry here. If you're one year back, yeah, maybe you'll perceive a little, little development there. Maybe not. If we go back and go through the jacket, even use analogs, it's information that's valuable. Uh, this is this is new. This is this is developing. This is developing uh, asymmetry slash mass, um, and this is this is concerning. So it's invasive lobular. Same thing with calx. Here we have a small grouping of calcifications. You may say, oh, they're so somewhat round. Maybe this is just coarsened a little bit. It's pretty stable. But if we go back four years prior, there's definitely a change. And this is a DCIS. It's a current exam. We have a, an asymmetry questioning here immediately. It's in the danger zone. So again, I'm going to go through and look at anything and everything I have. And sure enough, in 2004, it's analog, but it's information that's a fluctuating cyst. We can let that go and avoid an unnecessary callback. So there's an example. Here's a current exam. It's in the subarular breast. It looks all potentially a mass-like. It's got convexity posteriorly. Is that developing asymmetry or mass? When looking at three years back, when I went through the priors and we found a five years five years ago that's uh, totally stable. Uh, it's just summation. There's nothing on the MLO view. That's just a summation artifact. The corner of the image cancers are always responsible as a radiologist in any any modality. And here we have a new rounded asymmetry rate and fairly from area full region, tricky area. That's why I want to have our tissue out as much as possible. So we don't miss these. And here's our ultrasound correlates, an ovoid solid hypochoic mass with indistinct margins. And this was a DCIS. CC view, MLO view, fortunately the tech was diligent, took an exaggerated lateral CC view. And that's a new high density asymmetry there that was an invasive ductal. Pretty easy to read mammogram, scatter fibroglandular. We can see a corner of the image asymmetry here that was new. Took it to ultrasounds. And uh, it's really important. We, as a radiologist, have the three dimensional location in our mind uh, to know where to target this because it's very subtle. This is a hyperchoic mass with indistinct margins. And uh, you know, you get, you get to go in in real time at yourself in your mind, knowing this has got to be the location I'm going to find this thing. And just subtly, you know, perceiving. Yeah, the echogenicity is, uh, is subtly different uh, than the surrounding neighbor tissues. It just That's the only way you're going to catch these things is just practice it. Go in and scan as much as you can and learn the different echo textures and um, you'll, you'll catch tumors on ultrasound. This is invasive ductal grade 2. Pattern recognition is very important. You know, new, increasing, it's always suspicious unless you can confidently 100% classify as an oil cyst or something absolutely benign. Um, really have to uh, proceed with caution, anything that's new or increasing. A concerning distribution, anything linearly oriented uh, is, is always concerning, and segmentally especially. Uh, that's a BIRES 4 or 5. Uh, we've got a biopsy. Again, new increasing. It's a, always of concern, especially in postmenopausal or high-risk patients. So here's a CC mag view for, for a group of uh, microcalcifications here. And we see there could be construed as round in morphology. But their arrangement as a group is linearly linear, excuse me. So linear distribution. Here's the ML mag. Some of them may be a little more pleomorphic, but you may think, ah, oh, it's not too worrisome, it's a round particle, but the distribution is concerning. And that's DCIS. Here again we have some round, fairly equal density particles, but they're wanting to arrange themselves linearly. So that's a concern. Recommend a biopsy. This is ADH, atypical ductal hyperplasia. You should know on your boards. Uh, you always recommend surgical excision. Um, and the reason is it lives in the bad, lives in bad neighborhoods. And 10 to 15 percent of the time, when the surgeon goes in and removes more tissue, we actually can discover a, a DCIS or an invasive ductal carcinoma. So it's standard of care to recommend excision for ADH. Here's a small little group. Potentially want to call these round, um, sort of innocent looking. Not so much on the CC view, a little more pleomorphic perhaps, but when we compare just one year prior, these were not there. 
they're new. Here's the other view. This is not there. And these are DCS and they're, it's a high grade. So careful with comparison. Uh, can't rely on morphology. Here we have some loosely grouped calcifications of uh, some fine uh, linear features here, maybe some branching features here. Uh, some amorphous particles, sort of a mixture. But well, that's a segmental distribution. The apex pointing towards the nipple here. It's concerning. Here again in the CC view, uh, mag view, we see some you know fine linear uh, features here. The distribution is definitely concerning. And what this means is if you don't get cancer, so and it can be hard when, when you know calcifications are loosely grouped and you're trying to locate on two different pairs. It could be, you know, it's conceivable your needle that hits this area instead by accident or this has to come out. You cannot you can't call this concordant. That's the significance. These are concerning. If we don't get DCIS, it's a discordant bi biopsy we have to assume we missed. And you have to go back and either repeat it, needle core, or excision. And likewise, similar uh, uh, patterns of uh, generally benign would be diffused bilateral, similar appearing. Uh, here we have a dense, dense pattern. We have two markers in place here. So it's busy breasts. If we look more carefully, we see multiple bilateral diffuse amorphous round punctate calcifications appearing. Similarly, this is a benign pattern. Now, if we saw one of these groups in isolation, though, in one, one breast, that's concerning. Uh, that needs a biopsy. That's at least that's a biod, you know, 4B. So we need to look at the pattern always. And the extent of the disease is very important. Uh, when, you know, our goal is to find cancer, but that's really when our work begins. Uh, the goal is to have a good surgical outcome. We want to go to the OR only once, hopefully, and we need. Therefore, we have to communicate. We have to set the surgeons up for success, surgeons and the patient up for success. So we communicate, and we have to work really well together. I mean, if there's any doubt, there could be some confusion. I'll, I'll email a picture of what I'm seeing in the MR uh, to to the surgeon. Say, here's this clip. This is you know five centimeters away. I, she's uh, sort of a B breast. I'm not sure if she's you know, this, this isn't going to work for conservation. If, if at all they had even thought about doing a conservation, you know, you have to communicate and just proactively anticipate a potential problem down the road. It's a lot of what we do is trying to see things, you know, two to three steps down the road. So we want a well-planned surgery, and you can maximize mammography and ultrasound. We utilize MRI when it's necessary, but use as much as you can, as much information as possible with the mammogram and the ultrasound. So this is a case where she's got a lump. We got a BB here, and we have an obvious, you know, high density obscured mass with some speculated margins. Take a closer look. There's some microcalcifications, and they're extending. They look very similar to the calcifications associated with the, uh, the known the, the the mass, which is suspicious. So these are automatically suspicious. These are, you know, they're different in morphology. It's, you know, most likely what you want to think that they're benign, but in this context what's going on here, they're automatically suspicious. We need to know it's going to change management. If uh, these are benign and the surgeon wants or the patient wants conservation, then we can think about, you know, bracketing. Um, uh, if they're positive, that's going to probably change uh, management to a mastectomy. And my surgeon, he just wanted to know about these as well. He's just like, let's just find out what these are if you're going to biopsy these. I just don't have to take as much tissue. I'm like, well, it's going to be DCIS, but he, he requested a, a biopsy there. So we did, we did the two, uh, groups of calcifications and then the obvious uh, BIRADS-5 lesion and this is multicentric carcinoma. She's definitively planned, you know, she, has, she has to have a mastectomy. And that was all from a mammogram, an ultrasound. Here we have uh, pleomorphic linear calcifications, very concerning. Um, it's important to put the measurement in the report, the length of the calcifications or the area of the calcifications. It helps the surgeon plan. So a 3.5 centimeter length of calcifications that are clearly suspicious in an A breast uh, means something much differently than 3.5 centimeters in a D breast or a C breast. So we have to uh, provide as much information um, that's relevant to what the surgeon needs. So when they're in the office, uh, they got a report and he's evaluating or he has some or she has some sensibility a sensibility of what you know what's the best uh, uh, route to go surgically so that's part of our job this patient uh, elected conservation we need to bracket we need to define this for the surgeon exactly how much is involved that we can see based on imaging 
So we slipped in two wires and she got clear margins. She was uh, very happy. So that's our goal. Here, this is not a nipple marker. This is a lump right behind the nipple. This lady had been in and out with uh, aspirations and whatnot. Uh, busy breast, um, but she's got, a, she's got a palpable now. And these nodes are a little high density. They're a little worrisome there. Um, so we did some spot compression imaging. I think there's an asymmetry uh, subtly so, but if, yeah, if you don't see a finding on an additional on the mammographic image, I think we all know we absolutely have to go to ultrasound. Um, if the if a diagnostic mammography is equivocal, um, it doesn't matter. We get an ultrasound similar with nipple discharge. If you have true concerning nipple discharge, like you know bloody or clear in the mammogram, we always do spot compression imaging and go to ultrasound. So palpable always. I think we all know that. So here's her mass behind the nipple. She's got speculated irregular margins. It's obvious by reds 5 or 4C. And she, we took a look at the, uh, in our practice, we, any 4Cs and 5s by reds, we, we evaluate the axilla. Um, and you can see this abnormal lymph node. Here's the, cor or, excuse me, the hilum. And the cortex is facing that hilum. That's abnormal. That needs to be biopsied to help plan the case for the surgeon. And so I read this remotely. We have to read at different centers. So the initial workup was done remotely and then presenting for the biopsy. Uh, I took a look at the upper outer quadrant. She had so much density and she's had cysts and just just want to survey the upper outer quadrant. Uh, and we came across this uh, hypocoic mass. It's very, you know, indistinct margins. And at first it's like, is it just some intervening, some artifact, you know, intervening bands? But you know, that's why you have to be in the room, real timing. It's so important. And as you turn and angle the probe, this thing wanted to persist. So definitely uh, you know, need to do the biopsy to find out what's going on. And sure enough, you know, both sites are in base abductal. And the axillary lymph node was positive well. And I use a BARD 14 gauge automated uh, device for most of my uh, ultrasound guided core biopsies. And so we did three biopsies, you know, cost effectively with a 14 gauge needle and able to define her treatment, which is a mastectomy, uh, with just a careful use of mammography using all the information uh, and ultrasound as we can. So that's uh, sort of the systematic approach. We need to have good image quality. Um, we're responsible for that. Um, if we miss a lesion due to, you know, poor positioning, it's on us. So that's paramount. Uh, we have to have a protocol, something consistent in place, whatever works um, in place. As you look at images, that you know, and you're relaxed, and you're, you're you know, you're you're at your best to detect something early. Um, know the danger zones, you know, behind the nipple, uh, medial, you know, all the four danger zones uh, are very important to have that on your radar. Uh, and pattern recognition, um, it may have individually benign features, but they're right they're, as a group, it's suspicious. So. And then the extent of disease and being accurate as, as best as we can to define it for our surgeons and our oncologists. So we'll go through about five cases here um, with some examples. Uh, and if we're going to if we're going to discuss a case, we have to have a common language, and we all know we, we have to know this by our This is just is how we function every day. It's the rules of the road. The language that we use um, dictates which categories we can place a lesion into, which dictates the concordant management plan. So it's important to adhere to, this, to the descriptors. Um, the report should be succinct. Um, we should be you know, correctly labeling, using the correct clock face and the distance from the nipple and the terminology, but we, we should avoid embellishment. It's just a pathway of confusion. So that's the goal is to not confuse. And if we adhere to the bi this will keep us out of trouble. We, Think of really. There's there's a very limited range of probably benign lesions. You know, circumscribed, uh, ovoid, solid hypocoic mass. You know, that's a, a complicated cyst or a, a focal asymmetry that has no ultrasound correlate that's not developing. The minute we see, you know, development, that's why they added the developing asymmetry in the lexicon because it has uh, significance. It's now that we have more data, there's a 15% chance that that developing asymmetry is a cancer. And so we have to chase it no matter how small it is. You know, you've seen the four and five millimeter lesions that we saw. We still have to chase it. It's, it does not fit into this category. It would be convenient to follow it in six months. That would be the convenient thing to do. But we have to, we have to, we have to chase it and, uh, and not give up. Uh, and then the Virads 5 lesions, that also keeps us out of trouble. If you describe, you know, a Virads 5 speculated hypocoic mass, all the terms 
and we don't get cancer just like that, you know, segmental calcifications, if we don't get DCIS in that situation, we that discord has to go to the OR. So we have to be careful about the terms that we use and how we're how we're uh, categorizing them because there's implications down the road with management surgical that if we're miscat we miscategorize, um, we can commit someone to an unnecessary uh, surgery or delay delay a diagnosis if it's you know truly developing a, a asymmetry that's concerning de delay in diagnosis. So we want to stick to the rules. So here's a 42 year old or just routine screening uh, baseline, no significant risk factors. Uh, Looking at this pattern, you may question whether there is a you know potential mass or this round asymmetry here. These are macro calcifications. This is 2D images. Here's the MLO view. It's probably hanging out here. She also had her TOMO, which is very helpful because we see more with TOMO. So <clears throat> she's not one uh, mass here. She's got multiple similar pairing, equal density masses scattered throughout uh, both breasts. Here's the MLO TOMO images here. You can see equal density scatter if you look carefully. So multiple masses bilaterally. And we can even see a little layering calcification within this uh, cyst. Uh, this is a BIRADS 1. I don't mention benign things. I don't raise the flag. I don't want the patient to worry, oh, is it really benign? If it's, there's absolutely no uh, you know, uh, concern at all that there's anything bothersome, I just stick with a 1, most of my reports, and just not even raise a flag. Uh, but that's you know that's individual. Um, I only mentioned BIRADS, you know findings that are BIRADS too. If I think there might be confusion with the the reader that comes after me, um, in that area and why my why my judgment was uh, you know the decision was made that's benign. I, then I'll I'll explain that. But otherwise, if it's not significant, just leave it alone. This is a really important uh, paper. It gets us off the hook. Uh, Dr. Sickles in 2000. Uh, and this is the rule of multiple bilateral similar appearing masses detected on routine screen. Um, do not need to be recalled if they all look similar. It's a criteria that we'll look at. And the frequency of cancer development and the stage of at diagnosis among the non-recalled cases of multiple masses are similar to the general screening population. Therefore, you know, recalling women for multiple masses and evaluating and doing cyst aspirations and follow-ups and it's not justified. But there's criteria. We have to have at least three masses and one mass in each breast. And at least 75% of the margin has to be circumscribed with the remaining margin obscured uh, by normal fibrolinic tissue. That's allowed. You can't have any portion that's indistinct or speculated. And then the masses, they have to have a similar appearance. So that really is helpful. And I think that's where TOMO, one of the areas TOMO is really helping, at least in my practice. You can see more and, and characterize it as bilateral similar appearing. Here is a case two we'll look at. It's a 47-year-old uh, routine screen, no significant risk factor. She's dense, heterogeneous here. It's busy mammogram, challenging to read. And she was recalled for, uh, her most recent was a 2014. This asymmetry question here, potential mass. And it's hard to see, is it here, is it here? It's hard to tell, so we brought her back. So this would be a bi red zero, we'll recall her because it's a change. And she, she was done on our mobile van, uh, 2D, and she returned for a 3D spot compression here. And we have a partially circumscribed, partially obscure equal density mass. So we're going to go to ultrasound and expect to see a cyst, and I see a cyst, and it's a septated cyst. And I go in, I scan every patient myself. A text usually take pictures uh, ahead of time, and then I go in and scan just to make it absolutely certain it meets benign criteria. We can see a few more little septations. It's looking very much like a clustered microcyst type of component to it. And what's helpful, if you have any doubt, you know, is there something going on with the wall? Or you know, to, to me, I can see, you know, in real time, you can you can usually resolve these. Made it out. This is this is a cluster microcyst component, and scan around elsewhere. You know, if you see similar uh, processes going on, uh, like we do, we see another area about three centimeters away, septated cyst, another grouping here. Some, it's benign. I help. I look elsewhere to confirm, just like with, you know, assessing the axilla. If you see similar axillary lymph nodes. Reassurance of symmetry and uh, bilaterality is uh, helpful. So this final assessment is a two. You could give it a three technically, but we want to get as many threes to twos with confidence. I don't like bi threes. Here we have a 72-year-old previous history of lumpectomy, left breast, so she's high risk. She's postmenopausal. Uh, she, we had Chenoweth Tomo. Uh, this is, you know, it was above a centimeter mass. I usually use about eight millimeters. We frequently are just going straight to ultrasound um, for things that we expect to 
to be assessed. I mean, you can I mean, it's the proper protocol is. I think it's debatable. We're, we're learning as we learn about tomosynthesis. I, you know, do you have absolutely have to do the spot compression? So, but technically, you, you know, we should probably do the spot compression imaging. But I was confident that we're well characterizing this lesion, uh, and it looked like expect to see So I took her ultrasound, saved the diagnostic, but. Probably for your boards, you would probably answer uh, do spot compression imaging and then you know ultrasound. Here we see a cyst, but we have to go in real time, and it's not entirely simple. Um, is there a small you know solid component to this cyst along that the, the back wall? So this is a this is not a simple cyst. It doesn't meet any criteria. Um, this is a bioreds four. She's postmenopausal. This wasn't there last year. She's you know she's high risk, so we need to biopsy and. This situation will definitely use a vacuum, not a bard. Um, we want to be really careful not to rupture the, the, the wall and the fluid so that it collapses and we're not able to discern the solid component. So very carefully get the needle in proper position. And this came back apricometaplasia. I think that's totally concordant and she's free to go for the year. And so the points uh, about case two, the cluster microcysts can fre frequently be assessed as a BIRADS two or if you know, there's any question, BIRADS three. Uh, but you have to recommend a biopsy. It becomes concerning if any portion of the margin is indistinct or there's any possibility of a discrete solid component. And again, it's particularly if it's new postmenopausal, I can't emphasize that enough. Here we have a 68 year old, um, no complaints. Uh, she's got, you know, heterogeneous patterns challenging to read. But when we compare, you can see there's concern for this developing uh, mass. Nothing, not too much here we start to see. This sort of fits dense. Uh, this is going to be a definite BIRADS recall, uh, a zero. Bring her back. We do the spot views and you can see it's obscured on the ML spot. This is done in an outside institution. CC spot, it's sort of, it's a little denser than I'd like it to be and we have a adjacent fat, so these mar this margin's a little indistinct, it's just a little too, it's fuzzy, it's indistinct. And uh, just to reiterate from going from MLO to ML, we're going to go localize our lesion correctly before we go into the room very carefully, uh, before we go into the ultrasound room, and it's consistent with the 12 o'clock lesion, just want to, you know, MLO to ML didn't change much, just to bring that point up. So we measure uh, back, and I usually subtract, I use, so if it's like, Nine centimeters back, I usually give a zone of about you know eight to nine, a couple centimeters because you know the in the uh, supine position with ultrasound you can lose a little length, but um, so I give a little variability for the for the technologist to exactly where to hone in. And we see this you know hypo to anechoic uh, ovoid mass really deep, it's right along the chest wall. And you know is this a cyst? Stay vascular. This is a four. We have a developing uh, mass here. Uh, she's postmenopausal, really deep location. We can't, with certainty, resolve this as a cyst. It's just too deep, and uh, that CC spot view is, you know, a little concerning. So we're going to recommend at least a cyst aspiration. If that doesn't, if that's unsuccessful, then we're going to go on to a biopsy. So we got in there, and it was it wasn't completely aspirating. Uh, so I. Uh, Portion of it seemed like yeah, maybe it's a little smaller. Maybe I'm struggling with a you know apricometaplasia or something like that. So I pulled out and uh, re tried a, a 14 uh, automated and it, the angle of her chest wall. This is a rare situation. Just it, it didn't feel like it was safe. Um, and so it's like, well, this, this really could be you know a, a, a dirty cyst or a. So let's just send the aspirate to cytopathology. And but if we're going to do that, that's no different than a biopsy. Sending aspirate to cyto is no different than a biopsy. You're sending tissue to the lab, so we need to mark it just like you would mark, you know, a, a needle core biopsy. So <clears throat> we sent it to lab and uh, we're, we're in the right area, obviously, uh, the marker's appropriate, but we get back this lesion. I don't expect anybody to know this is a rare lesion. Uh, it should be removed. Um, it's one that, you know, we'd have to, I would have to look up and just, uh, it's it's rare. That's not the, the point is that it's, the results are discordant. The bottom line, we didn't get anything that would account for uh, that old, that that mass, and it's not a cyst. So we have to do more. Uh, we have to get tissue. We can either go back and rebiopsy it, 
with a needle core or we, have, or we can go to surgery and do a surgical excision. So this is one you think about for a while. Um, and I had concerns that this is actually cancer and so the best for this patient is to go in and, and get do a good core sample and it's easy because we're just going to target the, the marker and take out this marker and put in a new one. And we did get back invasive ductal carcinoma grade 2. So the point of this case, there's a couple here. The carcinoma is particularly the high grade carcinomas it can persist, present as a cystic lesion and, and, and an ultrasound, very uh, scary. So you have to at all times incorporate what do the mammogram look like? What's the history? What's you know into your judgment when you when you assign a final assessment in concordance? And so in this case, this patient was she's postmenopausal. She has a developing, it's, you know, an increasing asymmetry or mass. It's a mass uh, on mammography. It's, it's equal to that CCV spot. It's sort of you know it's it's bothersome. The margins were indistinct. And so when we review all the imaging. There are features, you know, in retrospect, and I went back and looked at the uh, ultrasound that was done outside, and there's a question, this is a duct, so right there, it's like, this is this is cancer. So I'm going to do a needle core. I, you know, if we go to surgery and it, it's cancer, then she's got to go back again for a sentinel lymph node. So um, we spare two OR visits, and I think that was the right uh, course of action. So by doing, a, a, just going back and doing another needle procedure first. Um, this is a 30-year-old, new palpable mass. He's had uh, multiple prior excisions and both breasts for fibroadenomas. The assessment by the outside facility uh, was a probable fibroadenoma, and he did refer to surgery. Uh, but when you look at the video clips and you look carefully, this is not. These are microlobulated margins. There's some angulation and margin, indistinct. There's you know intent, there's peripheral and internal vascularity that's worrisome, and this looks like it's a duct. This is this is concerning, but we can be we want to have it we want it to be a fibroadenoma, but it just doesn't none of this criteria none of these margins at all um, would, would allow us to put it into a you know probably benign category, and it's scary because this is invasive ductal carcinoma grade three triple negative and these are the ones that can look like cysts they can look like fibroadenoma so we have to be really really careful. Uh, a true bi-red three is going to be absolutely circumscribed margins real time. This is just an adjacent labial. This is. Uh, very circumscribed, all margins, and sometimes it can be tricky to, to discern from, you know, their iso, iso colic, is, is this actually the real lesion? And so if we add harmonics, it'll help us uh, pop the lesion. So it's real, so that can be helpful. The next uh, case, this is a 41-year-old, no complaints, baseline exam. And she has this area of uh, distortion. It's a screening. And so I've seen reports where people say there is architectural distortion on the screenings and that's that is there's you know there's big implications because architectural distortion is something that typically has to come out surgically so we don't want to commit anybody in a screening exam. We're just going to say there's question architectural distortion and we're going to bring her back and do the appropriate spot compression images, appropriate diagnostic exam. Um, definitely recall this patient. It's always a worrisome finding architectural distortion. But in the spot views, we can see that it does persist, and there's radiating lines that don't really radiate to a central mass. So there's tethering, or it's you know, speculation, radiation without or definite central mass. That's what architectural distortion looks like. We're going to look at a lot of examples. And we took her to ultrasound. She's 41. This is baseline. This is solid irregular mass, posterior acoustic shadowing, uh, speculated margins. You know, this is very concerning. Um, this is given by your it's 4C do the needle biopsy. I think if I can you know, say one thing is just to learn to hold the probe and the needle by yourself. Um, it's much more efficient and doing those tough little lesions and you know axillary nodes, if, you're, if your brain, your hand-eye coordination is, is managing the needle, that's it's just so much easier. So um, in my fellowship we weren't allowed to, you had to hold the, had to hold the probe and the needle yourself and I, I'm fortunate that I, that I had that uh, that training, so it's it's been it served me well with, like I said, particularly difficult actually nodes that getting getting that lymph node, um, and I I also like to use I want the experience to be uh, you know pleasant for the patient. I, so I I think the 30 gauge has been for the initial nubbing of the subcutaneous tissue has been very helpful. You don't want the patient to move. So if they're on the stereo table and you know they move their little clusters, now I got to retarget. So I want everything to be as gentle as possible. Um, and so the 30 gauge initially, you know, most patients just 
they don't feel anything at all. And then you then you go deeper with your uh, your uh, deeper numbing, and you know very slowly, carefully, uh, so that you know it's a pl it's not an uncomfortable uh, experience. So the results in this 41 year old um, did come back uh, as expected, a, a radial scar um, or cancer, but uh, has suspicion for radial scar, and that should come out. Uh, that's we have a significant. We have a very concerning. We had a 4C. We call this a 4C, and uh, we have a you know, concerning mass here. Certainly, we had residual. You know, this didn't. We didn't completely remove this with that needle, so we can't follow this in future mammograms. How are we going to follow that? So this needs to be removed. So we're gonna rec uh, that that case, we'll recommend surgical excision. Um, there's more recent with now that we're seeing more architectural distortion. You know, with tomosynthesis, little lesions that may have been removed completely, and the patient's low risk. We might be able to, you know, we're probably going to begin to follow those more, but I think you have to, it's case by case in our practice, and any, you know, residual concerning lesion, it, we need to excise it because of the potential for upgrade. Similar, uh, or the same concept as a DCI, or excuse me, an ADH. There's a, there's a chance of upgrade when you remove a radial scar, so you need to be careful. Here's a, a postmenopausal patient. This is another example of you know, architectural distortion. And this is an invasive ductal carcinoma tubular histology. I just think it's good to know, uh, to be aware that this has a very good prognosis. So when you're calling results for your patient, you can say, yeah, unfortunately it is a cancer, but you know, uh, these patients, most patients do very well and we can easily treat this. So um, tubulars are, if you're gonna pick an invasive, this is the one you wanna pick. So here we have some tomo uh, images and the normal tissue planes, how my eye sees tomo is they're very, you know, they're gentle, they're sweeping uh, as you scroll in and out, and boom, here we hit an area of architectural distortion, upper outer quadrant, and so uh, that's sort of how I perceive it. You sometimes have to take a step back and, whoa, what's going on? This is, you know, this is, this is distorted. It's tethering this tissue in this breast. It's not smooth like the rest of the tissue planes. This is invasive lobular. Again, you know, smooth, sweeping planes, all of a sudden, Whoa, what's that? It's small, but it's hard to tell. Is there a central mass? I don't know. There's distortion, though. And this is invasive lobular. Here, this is uh, yesterday, a you know, 42-year-old, and very dense, extremely dense, but look at how Tomo helps us see this area of distortion. And this is a radial scar. You can see a solid, irregular, similar to that first case, uh, similar age as well, irregular hypochoic mass. And that's going to need to be removed. This is a busy breast. Hard to read mammogram. We have tomo. And we can see architectural distortion here, the upper outer quadrant. And this is another invasive lobular carcinoma. And this is an unfortunate case. Multiple areas of architectural distortion. She had multiple invasive uh, lobular carcinoma on the right and an invasive ductal on the left. You can see the skin retraction here. These aren't too common to see cases like this, but it's fairly striking. She presented with a palpable. Here's a marker here for a palpable and all of this disease. Invasive ductal here, skin retraction. So the key points, architectural distortion is concerning always. Um, it's, as we can see, it's difficult to perceive. Um, Tomo helps a lot. Different diagnosis is limited. <coughs> I mean, it's either a prior biopsy, and you can see distortion from core biopsies too. You know, generally excisional, we see uh, distortion, or it's you know it's a radial scar, complex uh, or CLS, uh, or cancer. And the implications are these patients generally very frequently have to go, you know, they have to have excited, they have to go to the OR. So um, it's tough to see. It's an important uh, finding, um, and we have to manage it uh, correctly. And as we've as we're seeing more of it, you know, the, the debate will be, you know, which ones you remove and which ones you don't, uh, depending upon, you know, risk factor, residual lesion. But if you described it for, by REDS 4C or 5 in the report, it should come out. And then the final case here, this is a very uh, busy breast, lots of uh, masses bilaterally, speculated mass, we cannot miss these. That's, we just can't miss those. So when I see a BIRADS 5, some associated calcifications, I stop and I go to the other breast. 
in an exaggerated level view, this became this asymmetry became evident. And we took her to ultrasound and she has bilateral cancers. And we also evaluate the lymph node, because we do both sides there, uh, the four C or, or five by reds. And you can see there's a here's a lymph node here. This is focal cortical thickening. This is these are areas of metastatic deposit. That's what that looks like in it was a positive lymph node. So the hardest cancer to find is the second cancer. And that is it. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Does anyone have any questions? 